Does that work? No, it takes a second to start working, you see. Um, all right, it is our great pleasure um, for our fourth department seminar of the term to welcome Professor Justin Clark Doan from Columbia University. Justin is the author of the recently published um, AUP book, Morality and Mathematics. Uh, he's also uh, twice been selected for uh, the Philosopher's Annual, um, writing on issues in uh, metaphysics, um, mathematics, and metaethics. Um, and uh, today, Justin will be speaking to us on the topic uh, Russell's inductive method in mathematics and philosophy. Um, thank you. Uh, so I, somebody is saying that there's an echo. Um, uh, I could try putting in headphones if if that would, if that if it. Oh, it's it's okay now. Okay, great. Um, okay, so thank you so much for for having me. Um, I'm super excited to to be here. Um, uh, uh, yeah. So what I'd like to do today is to talk about um, uh, what's normally uh, thought of as Goodall's uh, epistemology of mathematics. So I'll, I'll, as I'll say, it, it sort of originates in Russell, um, even prior to Principia Mathematica. Um, and, the, you know, this epistemology, if there's anything like, you know, an orthodoxy and foundations of set theory, um, this is this is the orthodox, I guess, uh, epistemology of set theory. Um, I'd like to talk about um, um, it and uh, the, what might be the, the standard criticism of it, uh, famously articulated in, in Paul Ben Asseraf's paper, Mathematical Truth, and then refined by many other authors. And I'm going to argue that the criticism uh, of Ben Asseraf and uh, people following him uh, misunderstands the, the purpose to which Goodall was putting his epistemology and the best way to, to think about it. Um, but then I'm going to go on to argue that um, that that Goodall's epistemology, Russell's epistemology, the Goodall-Russell epistemology, sort of fails on its own terms. So there's a different problem. There's two problems. One is one problem is explaining justification. That's normally taken to be the kind of easy one. The other is explaining reliability. That's supposed to be the hard one. But Asaraf um, is commonly taken to have shown that the Goodall epistemology fails with the hard problem. I'm going to say the hard problem is the easy problem, and the good old epistemology fails with uh, what's really the hard problem, the justification problem, even though that's that's the one that it's really best understood as trying to address. Um, uh, and I'm going to conclude by, um, I'm going to, of course, consider some uh, responses to this, uh, the, the, dis, the, 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 the argument that I'll make, but I'm going to conclude with some um, reflections on what, um, this failure says about the difference between a priori or armchair inquiry, including philosophical inquiry and empirical scientific inquiry. Um, all right, so um, let me just start out by kind of just briefly reviewing, um, you know, what I take to be more or less the standard line on how we know the axioms of mathematics. And when I say the axioms of mathematics, I'll generally be talking about the axioms of ZFC set theory um, you know, there's some debate whether um, that's the proper framework. It, nothing would change if one uh, accepted a different framework. Um, but uh, but but this is this is the standard uh, view. Um, so so how do we know the axioms? Um, you know, there's a sort of despite the fact that um, I don't really know of anyone who. Uh, you know, works on these issues, who, who believes this, there's still a, a surprising number of people who will tell you, um, uh, including mathematicians, um, that, that uh, axioms are, here's a quote, just a random quote from uh, Joshua Green in a recent book, uh, axioms uh, of mathematics are statements that are self-evidently true. So if philosophy, for example, is like math, then the philosophical truths to which we appeal in our arguments must ultimately follow. Oh, sorry, that should be from philosophical axioms. He's talking specifically about morality, but the same thing uh, applies to, um, to philosophy more generally, from a manageable set of self-evident truths. So 
you, you know, if you ask a, 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 a typical, I, I guess, philosopher, but also I think a mathematician and, and many others offhand, you know, what's the difference between, say, ethics and math? I mean, here's one of the main differences. Uh, we prove things in math and a proof is just a deduction from the axioms and nobody seems to really disagree about the axioms in math but you know people argue endlessly in ethics for example and the same would be true of metaphysics or epistemology or whatever so um uh you know the the, the problem is just there's no there's no defensible notion of self-evidence in which this claim is possibly true uh of math and and i don't as i say know of anyone who actually defends this view um, in print today, um, you know, here's uh, John Mayberry, um, the set theoretic axioms that sustain modern mathematics are self-evident in differing degrees. The most important of them, namely Cantor's axiom, the so-called axiom of infinity, which just says there's an inductive set um, uh, or a, an infinite set in, in the intuitive sense, uh, has scarcely any claim to self-evidence at all. Uh, you know, here's Bulos uh, complaining uh, about uh, a remark that Goodall said sort of offhand and shouldn't have been taken too seriously. He says, I am by no means convinced that any of the axioms of infinity, union, or power set force themselves upon us, or that all the axioms of replacement that we can comprehend do. Um, uh, he says, not, it's not on your handout, but, you know, he says that there, that, that there are doubts about the power set axiom in particular is, is of course, well known. There's nothing unclear about the power set axiom. This isn't a question of indeterminacy or something, but it does not seem to me unreasonable to think that it's not the case that for every set, there is a set of all its subsets. Um, and, you know, uh, we, 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 um, for, for basically all the different axioms uh, that, that Boulos uh, uh, raises concerns about, you know, there are variations of set theory that that limit those or do away with those or or whatever um okay so so the idea that we know the axioms of math just by you know like the kind of euclidean ideal that we just like deduce them from self-evident principles as as um as as uh as nice a picture as that might be i mean that's just there's no way that that's just not tenable in light of developments over the last 150 years um if it ever was um, and already Bertrand Russell in his work in the foundations of math was well aware of this and um, already he articulated a different picture. Um, and, you know, it's funny, like there's this funny line in Principia Mathematica, you know, well into it, um, you know, there's just like it, it, page after page of just like um, unbelievably painful uh, symbolism. And then, you know, eventually, you, um, uh, Russell and Whitehead get to the proposition that uh, it's either one plus one is two or two plus two is four. And he says, you know, this can sometimes come in useful. And, and, and the, 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 the sort of irony of that um, juncture is that we already knew that one plus one was two and that two plus two is four or whatever. And we've just spent like 150 pages getting there via abstruse like logical theorizing that is definitely not obvious and that we didn't already know. So what is, what is, how is this working? And the way it's working, according to Russell, this is actually before he, uh, you know, began work on that uh, book. He says, we believe the, this is in, this is in a lecture he gave uh, called uh, the, the regressive method for discovering the premises of mathematics. We believe the premises, uh, the axioms of mathematics, because we can see that their consequences are true, instead of believing the consequences because we know the premises. But inferring the premises from consequences is the essence of induction. Thus, the method for investigating the principles of mathematics um, uh, is really the inductive method and is substantially the same as the method of discovering general laws in any other science. So what Russell's saying is, look, obviously, the epistemological structure of math is not the logical structure I'm giving you in this book. It's not like the logically primary things are the abstruse logical principles that I'm going to propose to derive math from. The, the epistemologically primary things are things like 2 plus 2 is 4. 
And in this sense, math is just like empirical science. It's not like the datum is forces mass times acceleration and then deduce. The datum is, oh, the baseball fell at 9.8 meters per second squared. Oh, the planet's orbit like that. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Is there a way to systematize and explain all of that under a single sort of principle? And um, the, the key idea to this um, lecture that Russell was giving is that really math, um, contrary to sort of the Euclidean cartoon, is just like empirical science. It's just that the data that we're sort of ultimately answering to is something like, you know, rational intuition as opposed to observation. So the, 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 basic, the basic claims that we're trying to systematize are things like two plus two is four, as opposed to the baseball accelerated to the ground at 9.8 meters per second squared. But the, but, the, but the structure of the reasoning is the same. That was the, that was the idea. Okay, this idea was very much taken up by Goodall and most of the writing since on the epistemology of set theory starts with Goodall, not Russell. Um, you know, here's, here's, here's Goodall talking about, talking about Russell's approach. Um, Russell compares the axioms of mathematics with the laws of nature and logical evidence with sense perception. So the axioms need not be evident in themselves, but rather their justification lies exactly as in physics in the fact that they make it possible for these quote, sense perceptions to be deduced. I think that this uh, view has been largely justified by subsequent developments, and it's to be expected that it will uh, be still more so in the future. So Russell picked up this idea and it, it played a large role in his view about undecidables. Uh, that is sentences which you can't prove or refute from the standard axioms. Because his feeling was like, if this is your view of the epistemology of math, there's nothing particularly worrisome about an undecidable sentence. It's just another hypothesis that we hope that we can, you know, ultimately induct to a theory that implies it or its negation. Okay, so this is the, you know, I always hesitate to make sociological claims. I, I think that this is more or less the standard view among people working in the foundations of set theory up to today who take seriously the question of what axioms are true, like people like Hugh Wooden, for example. Um, okay, so um, so there's a, there's a very famous objection to this whole picture. And, you know, uh, in, in kind of epistemology, class, Goodall is regularly, you know, uh, a sort of uh, cartoon figure that we make fun of uh, because, you know, what is the sixth sense of intuition where intuit the mathematical entities, um, you know, we have some understanding of how we would perceive things in the world around us to use the word perception to talk about our knowledge of axioms of math just seems like, um, you know, a very superficial analogy. And Ben Asaraf, uh formulated it in his uh, paper, Mathematical Truth. He writes, I find this picture both encouraging and troubling. He's talking about Goodall's uh, uh, specific um, articulation of the Russell approach. What troubles me is that without an account of how the mathematical sense perceptions, quote unquote, force themselves upon us as being true, the analogy with self sense perception and physical science is without much content. For what is missing is precisely an account of the link between the cognitive faculties, or our cognitive faculties, and the objects known. In physical science, we have at least the start of an account, and it's causal. Uh, we accept uh, as knowledge only those beliefs which we can <clears throat> uh, appropriately relate to our cognitive faculties. Of course, there's a superficial analogy. Uh, we verify axioms by deducing consequences from them concerning areas in which we seem to have more direct perception, quote. Uh, clearer intuitions, but we're never told how we know these uh, these clear propositions, these these intuitions in the first place. Um, okay, so so this is you know been a very influential uh, objection. Almost immediately, people said, um, "You you know this is this is uh, if you're demanding that we give a causal theory, we show that mathematical knowledge satisfies a causal theory of knowledge. It's a non-starter. I mean, the, you know, the causal theory of knowledge uh, that that Benassaraf is 
uh, is appealing to here is Goldman's and the, the, the beginning of that paper is, don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about things like math here. <laughs> I'm talking about, you know, sense perceptions. So, 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 you know, the immediate uh, move was to object to Benassaraf on the ground that the causal theory of knowledge is a hopeless theory of knowledge. But then the second iteration was, okay, fine. So he was wrong about that, but there's clearly a problem here. And, you know, W.D. Hart, I think, you know, put it, which just as there should be some naturalistic account of our knowledge of math. And what, but what Ben Asaraf is saying is there doesn't seem to be one. Um, merely appealing to intuition doesn't help. Um, the, the, the analogy so far is just a very, very kind of superficial analogy with sense perception where we have at least the beginnings of a naturalistic account of how it is that we reliably detect our surroundings. Okay, so the key question is what does Benassaraf mean by account? And that term is, is ambiguous, uh, at least between two different things. There's even a third thing that he could mean, but the ambiguity comes out clearly in what's become the kind of starting point for work on this issue um, since the late 80s. And, and, it, um, and it, it, the, 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 the sort of uh, the, the, the go-to text here is uh, the introduction to Hartree Field's Reels in Mathematics and Modality, where he writes, we should grant that there may be positive reasons for believing in standard axioms. These positive reasons might involve initial plausibility where initial plausibility here could be thought of as like intuitiveness or, um, you know, that the axioms or theorems strike us as true. But Benassaraf's challenge is to explain how our beliefs about these remote entities can so well reflect the facts about them. If it appears in principle impossible to explain this, then that tends to undermine the belief in mathematical entities, despite whatever reason we might have had for believing in them. Okay. So look, there's a lot of work interpreting field and stuff and lots of different ways to understand what he's getting at here. But it seems to me like the important point here for our purposes is that there's a distinction between two challenges, two accounts one could be asking for. Um, and what field is saying is that, look, maybe the kind of good old epistemology provides one kind of account but it's definitely not providing the second, and it's the second kind that's the really tricky one. So Benassaraf's challenge, we can, we can sort of partition it into two parts, and the two parts correspond to what are commonly thought to be two parts to knowledge, an internalist component and an externalist component. And one part of it is the challenge to explain the kind of reasonableness of our beliefs, or the justification, or the you know, praiseworthiness of, uh, you know, why is it reasonable to believe the axiom of replacement? Another is to explain why it is that our beliefs are reliable symptoms of the truth. And these are just different questions. And um, Goodall, it seems to me, uh, is straightforwardly only addressing the first of the two questions. That is, what he has to say about this matter isn't even kind of on topic if we understand it as being about the second. It's not like a lame attempt to answer the second. It's not even, it's like a category mistake to see it as an attempt to answer the second. So Goodall is offering, it seems to me, what has come to be known in the literature as a phenomenalist or dogmatist response to the question of what explains justification. Um, it's in the spirit of recent authors such as John Bankson, um, Chudnoff, Humer, Pryor. Th these, these authors, of course, have different focuses. So like Pryor's was, was focused on sense perception. Why is it reasonable to believe that there's a hand here? And it, he said it has something to do with the fact that it strikes you that there's a hand here and you have no independent reason to doubt that. Um, now, the point is that theories like this aren't even pretending to explain reliability. That's a different issue. You know, how it is that my cognitive faculties work such that when I, it seems to me like there's a hand here, there tends to be a hand here, that's a different issue. And it's an important issue, but it's not, it's not even on the table when I'm trying to explain the reasonableness of my belief given a certain phenomenology. 
So such theories do not even pretend to answer the reliability challenge. They're trying to answer the justificatory challenge, or the, the, the challenge to explain justification. So, um, you know, here's the, a very famous remark from Goodall, and I think that, you know, this is very uh, characteristic of, of recent work in this tradition. Quote, despite their remoteness from sense experience, we do have a perception also of the objects of set theory as is seen from the fact that uh, at least some of these axioms force themselves upon us as being true. I don't see why we should have any less confidence in this kind of perception, i.e. mathematical intuition than in sense perception, which induces uh, us to build up physical theories and to expect the future sense perceptions will agree with them and to believe that a question not decidable now has meaning and may be decided in the future. Um, so, uh, so, so, uh, so what I think is that um, the Benassaraf criticism, the Benassaraf field criticism of, of, of Goodall is just like kind of missing the mark. Now, of course, somebody might say, okay, fine, uh, as a matter of like Goodall scholarship, he failed to understand what problem Goodall was trying to solve. Nevertheless, the point remains, there is the reliability problem, and that's a serious problem. However, I think the situation is exactly flipped. It's not just that Benassaraf and Field misunderstood Goodall, it's that, that the problem they think is the real problem isn't even the real problem, and the problem that Goodall was trying to answer actually is. So, um, you know, I, I won't make the case in any detail here, though I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, I've, you know, written on this, um, and, uh, and, you know, I'm happy to get into the details in the Q&A if you want, but, but the reliability challenge itself is ambiguous. And the, it's, it's ambiguous in the following sense. What does it take to explain reliability? We've already says, said it doesn't take to um, establishing a causal connection. So there's a number of different options one might you know, list. Um, one might take explaining reliability, for example, to, sh to involve showing that our beliefs are safe in the epistemologist sense. We couldn't have easily had systematically false ones or sensitive in the sense that had the truths been, had, had, had the content of my belief been false, I wouldn't have still believed it. Or maybe objectively probable, the correlation between the truth and my belief. So no matter how you understand it, and I mean, there's some other ways too, um, it seems to me like all of these ways um, were going to be equally well placed uh, to give an answer to that challenge in the mathematical cases in the empirical scientific case. And as I say, I've like, you know, made this case elsewhere. I'm happy to talk about um, the reasons. Um, let me just illustrate it, for example, with, with the case of objective probability. Um, so suppose you took the, you know, somebody says it would just be a fluke if, if your mathematical beliefs aligned with the truths and one took fluke there to mean it's improbable. Well, they don't mean epistemically improbable because that's just another way of talking about justified credence. So they mean objectively improbable where, of course, that notion is an obscure notion, but let's suppose we understand it. So the goal then would be to show, assuming the actual truth of our beliefs, because this isn't a convince the skeptic kind of scenario, um, that the correlation between the fact that replacement holds or the fact that choice holds or something and the fact that I believe it is, is is um, that's an objectively likely correlation. But, you know, that will follow if it's objectively likely that I believe choice and um, replacement and so forth, given that the objective probability of choice and replacement and so forth is one. So um, long story short, it's not just that I think as a matter of kind of hermeneutics or something like Ben Asaraf and Field misunderstand Goodall, it's that I think they've really kind of like shifted the conversation in the wrong direction and that it is in fact the justification question that was important to start with. So Goodall wasn't trying to answer the reliability question, but even if that were what he was trying to answer, he shouldn't have been because the justification question is the really tough one. Okay, so um, let me try to make that case now. So here's the, here's the big picture. Um, uh, the big picture is that Russell and Goodall say that, look, everybody's so worried about the epistemology of math. It's really just like the epistemology of science. All that's different is the data we're responding to. Um, 
Benassaraf comes along and says, actually, there's this major difference. We understand how we'd be reliable detectors of the, uh, of the empirical facts, have no sense of how we'd be reliable detectors of the mathematical facts. As I say, I don't think that that's actually the problem. Uh, the problem is, it seems to me, that there is fundamental disagreement over the data to be systematized or explained or counted for in the mathematical case that has no analog in the empirical scientific one. So, um, so, so what I mean by that is, you know, look, everyone knows who's taken philosophy of science that there's, you know, observation is theory laden and, um, and of course we can have impaired perceptual faculties, um, blah, blah, blah. Here's all I'm saying. It does not seem that fundamental scientific disagreements over, you know, the extent to which climate change is caused by human beings or um, the details of evolutionary theory or something. It does not seem that fundamental scientific disagreements primarily turn on what is observationally evident. Disagreements about that. What the observational data is. My claim is that in the mathematical case, and I'm going to ultimately be suggesting that, you know, this is how it is kind of across the board with armchair inquiry, including philosophy, that is the primary cause of the differences of view. So in the mathematical case, it's not like we've got this body of observations before us that basically everybody agrees to. I mean, yeah, you know, some of them are more theoretically loaded than others, and there will be there will be tricky cases, but basically we all agree to the body of, of evidence, and now we just disagree about what best accounts for the evidence. What I'm gonna say is it's exactly not like that in math, and so this is where the analogy to science breaks down. Okay, so, um, all right, so, so you know, there's, um, to, re to, to fully make this case, you know, uh, um, I'd have to go kind of axiom by axiom and um, uh, you know, uh, draw on authors uh, and their different accounts of why they believe it or why they don't. And of course, um, I, you know, there's no hope that I can do that here. What I figure is more useful is to do one, to, to spend a little time on one concrete case and look at it in a little detail. Uh, I can, you know, I can tell you, and I even have some quotes ready uh, if, you, if you need more defense, um, I can tell you that totally analogous things are said about the axiom of choice, about the axiom of replacement, about the axiom of power set, and so forth, as will be said about the axiom I'm going to talk about. It's just that more has been written on this axiom because it has more set theoretic interest. It has more interest among set theorists. Okay. so. Um, the, 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 the proposition that I'm going to talk about is uh, this thing called the axiom of constructibility. And, you know, one unfortunate thing about this is that to actually state it precisely, it's a fairly complicated statement, but the rough idea is very simple. Um, so the original cumulative hierarchical conception of set is just the following. We start with the empty set and then we take power sets. And we go up and we build a V. And at the limit stages, we just take unions. And we do that forever. And so what you end up getting is this cumulative hierarchy. And this is exactly the iterative concept of set. If you know, some of you will be familiar with this term, like Boulos' term, the iterative concept of set. This is just the iterative concept of set. Okay, here's something that's interesting about that idea. It's crucially obscure at two junctures. The first juncture is, I said forever, but what's forever? The axiom of constructibility doesn't settle that question. It doesn't tell you what forever means. What the axiom of constructibility does is it tells you what you mean by all subsets. Basically what you mean when you say all subsets is you mean all subsets that can be defined using only parameters from previous stages. That is, if I can um, come up with a formula and I only refer to things at some previous level of the hierarchy in that formula, then I can take a set of all the things that satisfy that formula. If I now put all those sets together that can be, put, can be constructed that way, that's the power set. So, the, so, so the, the point of the axiom of constructibility 
is that it gives you a it, it it gives you a precise characterization of what you mean by all subsets where without it we really don't know what we mean by all subsets and you know that comes out when you think when when you know in like the continuum hypothesis problem the continuum hypothesis problem is precisely whether the set of all subsets of natural numbers is the next greatest cardinality than the set of natural numbers and who knows given that i don't know how many subsets of natural numbers there are right so this tells you how many subsets there are okay so um look if there's anything like a standard view on the question of whether the axiom of constructibility is true i think the answer is no um but on the other hand i think the sociology on this is very unreliable so there's a lot of careful work that kind of follows around people who are very anti-constructibility and in favor of large cardinals and determinacy principles and that work has been has come out and you know been um it's it's um you know it's great work but it's 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 articulating in a philosophically perspicuous way the view of anti-constructibility people what's important is there are definitely pro-constructibility people too and crucially what seems to be at issue is um like the analog of uh in the empirical scientific case inconsistent perceptions that is the advocates of constructibility take as data or or intuitive things that advocates of its negation take as obviously false so look the the kind of word on the street is that um sorry first of all the axiom of constructibility is abbreviated v equals l l is the set, the universe of constructible sets the class of constructible sets and v is just the universe of sets so what it's saying is all the sets are the constructible sets um so uh so the word on the street is that v equals l is false because it's restrictive and i've already indicated one way in which that would be so you might think because what we're saying is that what do we mean by all subsets? And what we're saying is we only mean definable subsets in the sense I mentioned. Somebody might say, but aren't there other subsets that aren't definable in this way? And in fact, you know, some people have exactly this view. It's also restrictive in a less obvious way, which is that it, if V equals L is true, then certain large, large cardinal axioms, these are just strong axioms of infinity have to be false. So Dana Scott famously proved that if V equals L is true, then there isn't a measurable cardinal, uh, which is a very large <laughs> cardinal axiom by any ordinary standards, but for set theorists, it's really not that big. Um, okay, so V equals L is, if there's anything like a word on the street about it, V equals L is false because it's restrictive, um, but some take this restrictiveness to be evidence for it, and others take it to be evidence against it. So, you know, um, Drake in a famous book on large cardinals um, writes, uh, there seems to be no very good argument to say that V equals L should hold of the cumulative type structure, the cumulative hierarchy, most regarded as a restriction which may prevent one from taking every, every subset at each stage and so reject it. That was the point I was just making a second ago. Okay, writing at about exactly the same time, <laughs> here's Pinter, there's a strong intuitive basis for considering L to be the class of all sets. By definition, L can set, contains all the sets that are describable by a formula in the language of set theory, and there is no practical reason to admit sets which lack any description. They would merely muddy the waters. More recently, Monroe Askew, uh, Askew has taken this line um, and, uh, you know, other advocates like Ronald Jensen, who I'll mention in a second, um, take, take this line. Um, okay. As to the matter of, you know, large cardinals and its restrictedness in that direction, you know, once again, one person's modus ponens is another person's modus tollens. So, you know, Hugh Wooden writes, the axiom of constructibility V equals L provides a conception of the universe of sets, which is perfectly concise module uh, only large cardinal axioms, which are strong axioms of infinity. However, the axiom V equals L limits large cardinal axioms, which can hold, and so the axiom is false. And those are not my italics, those are his. Okay, Ronald Jensen, who is perhaps the world expert on the constructibility and the constructible universe and intermodels, 
like this, um, uh, writes, I personally find V equals L a very attractive axiom. L is adequate for all of mathematics. It gives clear answers to deep questions. It leads to interesting mathematics. Why should one assume more? I do not understand why belief in the objective existence of sets obligates one to seek ever stronger existence postulates. Why isn't Platonism compatible with the mild form of Occam's razor? So a couple of things to say about that. The first thing to say is, these are not philosophical disagreements in any ordinary sense of philosophical. It's not like one person's an anti-realist about math and the other's a realist. They're both realists. They both think there's a fact of the matter insofar as they have a position on that at all, and they think it's different. The second point is that, I mean, they could hardly be more different in orientation. One, one idea coming out of Wooden is that kind of the universe of sets should be as rich as can be. That's, that's the idea of math. Math is like the land of possibilities. The other idea is that the universe of sets should be like any other universe, like the empirical universe, like basically parsimony considerations should guide, guide our, our, our intuitions about it. And it should only be as kind of big as it needs to be. So these are radically, as, as Jensen puts it, these are radically different conceptions of what the universe of sets looks like. Okay, so I claim, though it would take careful hermeneutic work that I'm not prepared to do right now, I claim that paradigmatic debates in the foundations of math bottom out in clashes of intuitions in this way. Of course, there are exceptions as well. I'm not claiming that all of them are like that but they're definitely not generally logical disputes. There's no outstanding logical conjectures that are in dispute between Wooden and Jensen. Um, and and the, they're, they're in general, I think, not simply methodological disputes of the sort you would get by people who agree on the fossil record, but one person thinks, you know, that looking at the Bible is a reliable way of explaining the data, whereas another person thinks that um, evolutionary speculation is. Okay. so. I have to then concede um, something that uh, uh, Andreas Mogensen writes in another context. Diagnosing a clash of intuitions will typically involve attempting a careful hermeneutic reconstruction of the underlying dialectic designed to reveal that the dispute uh, rests ultimately with certain premises that one side finds intuitive and the other does not. Any such reconstruction is bound to be controversial Whereas many philosophers agree that some questions boil down to differences in intuition, there's considerable disagreement as to exactly which questions those are. The same is gonna be true for this, this case. What I really, if I'll be happy if I can convince you that debates over the foundations of math are like the debates over, uh, over, over modal metaphysics or like debates over grounding or something like that. If you agree that it's kind of like that, I'll be happy enough. Um, okay, so there's a variety of ways in which I can imagine somebody trying to say that this alleged disanalogy. So again, just to be clear, assuming that the Russell Goodall epistemology admits of an answer to the reliability problem, as I claimed, so that the real problem for the epistemology, um, you know, isn't the one Benassaraf and Field were pointing to. The question arises, is actually math just like science at the level of justification, even if not at the level of reliability? And what I've said in the last section is no, because in, in, in the mathematical case, there seems to be systematic disagreement over, so to speak, the sense perceptions. And in, in the empirical scientific case, while there is, of course, you know, fringe cases, some of which I'll talk about actually, and, and perception is theory laden, that doesn't seem to be the primary explainer of fundamental scientific disagreement. Okay, there's a few ways I can imagine trying to challenge this alleged disanalogy. So the first way is, is as follows. Um, controversial mathematical intuitions are like rare controversial sensory perceptions. They are theoretically loaded. They are precisely the ones that are theoretically loaded. Disagreement over whether there are more subsets than L allows, whether there's a measurable cardinal, or whether all projective sets are determined, is more like disagreements over the extent to which a biopsy sample harbors dysplasia, for example. 
that's a perceptual matter in the sense that it's a perceptual judgment that that's high grade dysplasia or something. But it's the kind of thing that nobody can seem to agree on. And that's why some pathologists think that we shouldn't even be using this technique uh, to, for clinical practice anyway. Um, okay. So the problem, I think, with this response is that in the empirical case, we can contrast perceptions, for example, of the degree of dysplasia with bedrock perceptions about the overt appearance of the biopsy sample stated in uncontroversial terms. You know, like this, right, this part right here is not very circular or something. However, in the mathematical case, uh, there appears to be no bedrock perceptions at all. Um, there, that is, there appears to be no intuitions that, okay, everybody's got those, and we just disagree about the, you know, it's very, it's actually, I think, very common to hear it put this way. Look, everybody agrees about ZFC and, um, and maybe that V equals L is false or something. It's just peripheral questions that really would only interest a set theorist that people have any, any real disagreement about. I think that's just, you know, sociologically false. It's certainly true that there's, as a, um, as a practical matter, there's a agreement in practice uh, about, you know, you, you go to real analysis class, you get, you're given the real analysis axioms, and you work with those, but that doesn't show that there's any deep disagreement about the least upper bound axiom. Uh, that issue is not broached in a real analysis class. Uh, Bell and Hellman write, contrary to the popular misconception of mathematics as a cut and dried body of universally agreed upon truths, as soon as one examines the foundations of mathematics, one encounters divergence of viewpoint that can easily remind one of religious schismatic controversy. And here an increasing radicalness are just some quotes to give you a sense of how it's going to be very hard to find the bedrock if there's bedrock. By the way, these are very eminent people. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Herman Weil is like one of the greatest mathematicians, physicists of the 20th century. This isn't some like quack, um, uh, you know, that uh, I found on the internet. Uh, so, uh, so Weil says it will be recognized. This is, by the way, during his predicativist phase, where he believes in classical logic, but he doesn't think the notion of arbitrary sets of real numbers makes sense. It will be recognized that in any wording, the least upper bound axiom of the calculus is false. That is the, the, the key axiom of, of calculus. Uh, Edward Nelson, the Princeton mathematician who recently died, the reason for mistrusting the induction principle of arithmetic is that involves an impredicative concept of number. A number is conceived to be an object satisfying every inductive formula. So Nelson thinks the notion of natural number is circular if we assume induction. Um, Zielberger, a mathematician at Rutgers, writes, I'm a Platonist, but I deny even the piano axiom that every integer has a successor. Harvey Friedman laments, I've seen some go, go so far as to challenge the existence of two to the 100. Um, and of course, if we were to start letting people like Hartree Field into the discussion, we would end up with the conclusion that there are literally no claims that are non-vacuously data. That is, Field will, of course, grant that there are conditional claims. If there were numbers, then something, or, you know, but, but Field doesn't think any atomic or existentially quantified sentence is true at all. Now, somebody might try to say he doesn't count because that's a philosophical view. My point is, it's just going to be very hard to come up with a principled place to draw the line here and claim this is the bedrock. This is, this is like the sense perceptions. And by the way, just in case it wasn't clear, there's, of course, a whole nother tradition of heresy stemming from non-classical logics. And I haven't even brought those up yet. And I won't actually today. These are all people who accept classical logic. So this is, this is purely mathematical disagreement. You know, when, when Vile's claiming that he rejects the least upper bound axiom here, he ended up being an intuitionist. But at this point, it's not, for, it's not on grounds of disagreement over logic. It's that he rejects the, the, the peculiarly mathematical content of that claim. Okay, so, um, so the second argument I can imagine somebody making is that basically there's always heretics. And all you're doing, Justin, is finding some heretics, just like a climate change denier or something, and trying to make a big deal of it. So people with heretical intuitions, the objection would run, are in the minority of experts. And this sociological fact 
uh, itself affords defeasible evidence that the heretics are, so to speak, hallucinating. Their, their intuitions are systematically off. They're, they're, uh, they're intuitively colorblind or something. And so, for example, Peter Kulner in his recent uh, SCP entry on, uh, on large cardinals and determinacy writes, projective determinacy has gained wide acceptance by set theorists, in particular intermodel theorists and descriptive set theorists who know the details of the constructions and theorems involved uh, in the case that has been made for projective determinacy. Okay, um, look, I, there's a lot to say about this kind of objection. The first thing that maybe the main point I wanna stress is I think that in contexts, armchair context, context where, uh, um, where we you know, figure out what to believe basically by reflecting, um, it's very hard to give a principled account of what's the difference between expertise and indoctrination. Or another way to put it is uh, expert training and indoctrination. So, you know, um, uh, Donald Martin, uh, the mathematician at UCLA writes, for individual mathematicians, acceptance of an axiom is probably often the result of nothing more than knowing what's a standard axiom. And the Fields medalist Paul Cohen uh, writes, the attitudes that people profess towards the foundations, that is what axioms are true, seems to be greatly influenced by their training and their environments. So, I mean, look, you know, if you're a student of Hugh Wooden, you know the constructions for uh, deriving projective determinacy. And you also are more likely to believe the premises of those constructions. Does that make you an expert in the relevant sense compared to somebody like Ronald Jensen who rejects those constructions, who also knows them, but you know, wasn't sort of uh, raised on them and, and, and indoctrinated um, by, by them? So while there may be, uh, while it may be true of people with views on, on what axioms are true, but, but uh, this is speculation, I don't know, and you should see a paper by Devlin, uh, he, I mean, he suggests the opposite actually, um, or people with the right views on these matters, it seems false of the most pertinent group, people who work on intimately related questions uh, with you know, trying to figure out what's the right view on them. Notoriously, as, um, as Russell put it, deep specialist knowledge turns, tends to turn something so simple as to not seem worth stating into something so paradoxical that no one will believe it. So that is to say, look, the more you know about choice and the arguments surrounding choice, the less likely you are to think it's obviously true. And the more likely you are to be a heretic about choice and start publishing on choice. It's the people who don't really worry about choice who will tell you in a poll, of course, choice is true. It's, 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 it's self-evident. Um, every set has a choice function. So as Thomas Forster writes, for people who want to think about foundational issues as resolved, standard axioms provide an excuse for them not to think about them any longer. It's a bit like the role of the church of medieval Europe. It keeps a lid on things that really need lids. And in fact, Kenny Easwarren has basically proposed exactly this account of axioms. Like axioms are, are a practical means by which to not have to settle debates. We just, we just assume some stuff and, and get on with proving theorems if we first had to settle whether the axioms are true, nobody would ever prove any theorems. Okay, the second point I wanna make about this objection, the, the kind of, you're just sent, pointing out that there's always you know, heretics, is that even if poll numbers may matter in the perceptual case, that is, even if it may be evidence that your view is wrong, if you, you're an outlier, in some empirical science, that mere fact may be evidence. Um, I doubt that it's evidence in the armchair cases. So scientists with conflicting perceptual faculties such as color blindness or deafness do not tend to argue that theirs are the reliable ones. Perhaps this is because there's an independent argument that evolution would have selected for reliable beliefs about our surroundings, though I think there's lots of places to get off the boat with that kind of argument. But anyway, let's suppose for the sake of argument that poll numbers are evidence in the, in the empirical scientific case. However, Jensen will not reject his, quote, deeply rooted differences in mathematical taste just because they're unpopular, and it's hard to see why he should. There seems to be no reason to assume that the true set theoretic intuitions, assuming there are such things, would be popular ind independent of their contents. In other words, 
like what what there seems to be no reason to think that um uh you know the the phd programs in in the foundations of set theory are likely to produce uh students whose intuitions reliably track the cumulative hierarchy that seems different than the case of um of of empirical science where that's an extrapolation from the things around us that can affect us and affect our survival so there's a sort of um there's a sort of disconnect between the subject and the forces that lead us to the beliefs we have now this is not to say that actually ben Asaraf was right and field was right all along and the problem really is reliability any reasonable reliable reliability challenge i think can be met the claim is that um, you should not antecedently expect the truth to be popular in the set theoretic case, where maybe you should antecedently expect the truth to be popular in the empirical case. That's what I'm saying. Um, okay, so uh, the final way that I can imagine resisting this alleged disanalogy between intuition and perception at the level of justification is that um, is that basically we should be deciding what intuitions uh, to take seriously on empirical grounds. We should we should be deciding basically what intuitions to be to be trusting based on which contents are indispensable to our best science. Like this would be like a kind of Quinean uh, way to figure out what intuitions to 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 look at. But the first problem with this idea is that, if anything, this approach would support wildly heretical intuition. So it would, it would definitely not be a way to vindicate standard set theory and standard practice. Already Quine, the reluctant Platonist, pointed out, I recognize indenumerable infinities only because they're forced on me by the simplest known systemizations of more welcome matters. Magnitudes and excesses such demands as Beth Omega are inaccessible numbers. I look upon, upon as mac, mathematical re recreation without ontological rights. So Beth Omega is already provable in ZFC. So, so Quine is saying that, you know, you actually, we don't actually even have good reason to believe that Beth Omega exists, even though there's a mathematical proof that it does in the ordinary sense of mathematical proof. And that's because the assumption of Beth Omega doesn't figure into the best overall science, even if you are very liberal about what math you're assuming in science. Befferman went much further than Quine. He's, he thought that uh, Vial's system uh, W exhausts what's indispensable for empirical science, and then uh, argued by this proof theoretic reductive uh, technique that W itself can be treated in an instrumental way. Its entities outside the natural numbers regarded as theoretical entities and the justification for its use lies in whatever justification gives rise to PA. So according to Pfefferman, if you're appealing just to what's indispensable to science, all you're going to get is natural number arithmetic. So that's nothing, you know? Um, and then of course, there's the more extreme view. Um, but I hope to have shown a second ago that you, you don't have to buy into this program to, to, to agree to the point. But there's the more extreme view, of course, that at the end of the day, we can do away with all mathematical sentences literally construed. And this is, of course, Hartree Field's uh, Science Without Numbers program. He says, when we can avoid all appeal to mathematical entities and explanations when the chips are down. It must be possible, for instance, to develop theoretical physics without any appeal you know, to things like uh, vectors in a Hilbert space. Okay, um, the second problem uh, is, is, with this this proposal is 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 a problem that, um, in a way, like George Beeler may, uh, highlights in in uh, a provocative paper called "The Incoherence of Empiricism" uh, back in the '90s, um, and that's just that the proposition that indispensability is a guide to truth in the first place itself appears to turn on intuitions over which philosophers notoriously disagree. All right, so it seems to me like there is this disanalogy at the level of justification. It's the real problem too, because the reliability problem I think can be met in both cases. Now the question is kind of what to make of this. Um, 
Well, one thing to say is if the Russell Goodall epistemology of mathematics is correct, then it closely resembles that of paradigmatic philosophy for all the good and the bad. Um, it should thus be unsurprising that even at the level of justification, uh, 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 the epistemology of math is more problematic than the epistemology of empirical science, because most people think that at the level of justification, the epistemology of, say, speculative metaphysics is 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 more so it also means that mathematics and logic because goodman who who introduced the notion of reflective equilibrium which you'll notice is very similar to russell's regressive method or inductive method um is no more the place to quote as hilbert put it find truth and certitude than speculative metaphysics in relevant respects it's philosophy all the way down and here's, you know, David Lewis describing the, the method of reflective equilibrium, which I hope you'll now see is really just the same thing we're doing in the mathematical case with all the same problems. Uh, and the same thing that we'll, we do in the logical case, as Goodman himself pointed out, our intuitions, quote, are simply opinions. Our philosophical theories are the same. Some are commonsensical, some are sophisticated, some are particular, some are general, some are more firmly held, some less, a reasonable goal for a philosopher is to bring them into equilibrium. Our common task is to find out what equilibria there are that can withstand examination, but it remains for each of us to come to rest at one or another of them. And we're, we should not expect to all uh, converge. There's no reason to expect that, not in the mathematical case, not in the case of speculative metaphysics, not in the case of ethics. So my own view is that the difference between intuition and observation discussed in this talk recommends what I call a pluralist approach to, to the metaphysics of armchair as opposed to empirical inquiry. It, it, it suggests, in my view, a sort of radically different picture of the world out there that we talk about in armchair areas versus the world out there that we talk about in things like physics or biology or sociology. Um, but of course, uh, you know, that's like kind of another another talk uh, and I'm happy to, to, to start on it uh, in the Q&A. So that's it, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Justin. I'm gonna clap silently. Um, <laughs> now we, uh, I'm gonna stop the recording now, actually. Thank you.